So, okay, so I'm going to skip the whole song and dance that I was going to do. Um, and um, I'm going to decline that phone call from my stepma. <laughs> um, now I'm echoing again. You're echoing oh. again. Can you hear me echoing? No. Okay. Well, we're just going to make it work. So I'm going to skip the whole song and dance that I was going to do about the National Book Foundation's history. We care about books. We were very proud when Sarah got up on the stage and won the National Book Award for nonfiction. Um, and we hope to keep getting books in all kinds of corners of the country where we know there are readers um, and who, not, who may not have been um, when I'm umming, it's because of the echo, so just forgive me. Um, but uh, we hope to find readers who have not been considered readers in every corner of this country. So now to the point, we are here to speak with Miss Broom, who has contributed to The New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, Oxford American, oh, the Oprah Magazine, amongst others. She received her master's in journalism from the University of California, Berkeley. And to go off script a little bit, the Yellow House is now out in a beautiful, bright yellow paperback <laughs> that you can squeeze and bend and that everyone in your family will desire now that there have been 13 hardcover reprints. <laughs> um, and she took, how long did you take to write this one? About 10 years. Not oh, about 10 long. years. Not very long. <laughs> so get it now, read it once, read it twice, while we wait with bated breath for the next one. Um, so where are you from, Miss Broom? Where am I from? You know how to jump in. I love this. Uh, you know, it's funny because I'm now in Harlem, which is kind of like, a version of being in New Orleans in a way. You know, the people have that same kind of flair and that kind of feeling about who they are in the world. And it's such a place in that same way, you know? Yeah. So, so that's from all of, all of those places. Where um, do you think of as home when you close your eyes and say, I need to get back to there? You know, that is such an interesting question because I actually feel that the work of writing the book complicated in irreversible ways my ideas and understanding about home. And now it feels like a kind of interior condition of mine, almost like a state of mind, you know? And it's, I think somehow I disconnected myself from the idea that home is an architectural, is a piece of architecture or a specific building or even a specific place, but that it's more a kind of sensory connection mm -hmm. I have with a certain smell or, or even a certain idea, right, can mm -hmm. become home for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's the thing I'm thinking a lot about still. Yeah, and the reason why I ask is obviously because in case you haven't read it yet, <laughs> um, The Yellow House is about where Sarah was born and raised. Um, whenever you have a book that succeeds, right? Like it's on all these recommendation lists and it won an award, will win many, many awards. Um, but it takes on sort of the characterizations that the group at large give to it. So sure. how do you feel like people describe your book and how would you clap back at what you've heard people say about what they think the book is. Well, if you want. That is such a, that's such a good question because you know so much of that is out of your control, right? So you mm -hmm. make the thing and then in a way it it does actually become whatever the reader makes of it. I I actually feel that it can be the the Katrina book and it can be the family story and it can be you know, the story of New Orleans, right? Mm. Of course, in my mind, I I wanted to write a kind of autobiography of a house. That's the way I thought of it. Mm. Um, I wanted to write a book that was like Beardanesque, 
you know, the way that Romare Bearden took all of these different pieces and, you know, journalism and anthropology and ethnography and, and, um, and thinking about uh, architecture and thinking about uh, space and thinking about city planning and what is Jane Jacobs talking about and how is that applicable to the street where I grew up and mm -hmm. what is uh, zoning all about and, and what do people mean when they say urban planning, right? And so I think for me, maybe what I'm saying really is that I think it's impossible to define for yourself what the thing ultimately becomes, though I think mm -hmm. I try very hard to make it this sort of exploration into how you put something together that's, mm -hmm. again, that's been decimated for you. Right, right. You know? Right. And so each book, if each book is a conversation with a, an imagined reader, somebody that you, you know, can't predict what kind of story they're gonna pull out of it. What do you wanna say? Like what, what was the spirit in which you started this conversation? We know the pieces, right? Like the collage work of thinking about different types of work and how you use a house, mm -hmm. as a, you know, as a stand in for so much that's happening in the world and your sure. life and your family. I wanted to talk a little bit about mapping and, and take on this powerful position as a cartographer. And that was actually a form of play for me to say, okay, yes, we're, we're, we're not worthy of existing on several maps, but I'm going to actually draw in all these extremely interesting people and places who I love and all of my 50 nieces and nephews and all these sort of ragtag stories that people are telling and insert them, drop them into this narrative that has been existing for so long. And I wanted to talk about and make fun of the kind of rigidity of, of narratives, the way they become, the way mythologies become calcified, the way they become mm -hmm. suffocated, suffocating. And then also I think have something to say about what I think is a very human and existential way that we as beings, and I know all of us feel this now, connect to the places we're in, you know, and, and really begin to think about what a home tries to do, what it's required to do, how we can belong to spaces in really uh, tenuous ways, you know, mm -hmm. and how we are a space actually. Right. And and so I don't know, it just became this out of control sort of journey that I was on to think about mm -hmm. home really and, and a building itself and, and what it could say and what it what it can't say, what the limitations are. Mm -hmm. I think that right, thinking about a house and what it means and the geography yeah. of a place was forgotten, what's not the zoning. You're describing it in a before time and an after time, right? With Katrina as the dividing point. We're living right now in the first days of an after, or maybe just waiting for the after to come. We're still in, mm -hmm. you know, the thick of it. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think the reader will take away now in July of 2020 that they might not have, even as a fan, you know, somebody who was really into it in December. What do you think it might mean now to read the book? Well, I love that you mentioned after times, which Eddie Glau talks about in his book about Baldwin and is a Walt Whitman idea, right? And one of the things that I've been thinking so much about is I think now, if you look at the book, you, you'll you think, oh, this is about the patterns maybe a little more clearly, because part of what I was trying to say, for instance, about Katrina, is that if for you, that was a moment of reckoning for the first time, then, you know, there's a way in which you maybe weren't paying attention to all the times before then, mm -hmm. right? Where similar things actually happened, where there were floods, where neighborhoods were decimated, where people were forcibly displaced and migrated, right? 
And so I think it, it's, it has to do with patterns, I think, and looking back and saying, oh, this is the thing maybe she was trying to talk about, which is that when I was four or five or six or seven, I knew that the ground was soft and couldn't really hold us, right? Mm -hmm. And that was really a story about, as children, we tried to reckon with it by saying, oh, the ground's quicksand and, you know, it stole our ball and, you know, don't go over there, the ground will eat you, right? Mm -hmm. But really we were talking about subsidence. We were talking about environmental catastrophe and injustice. When we were children, we knew in our bodies and in our, our sensibilities mm -hmm. that there was something deeply wrong about the ground, right? The foundation. And I think, so looking back on it now, you can see the ways in which there's this sort of cyclical nature to it all. And mm -hmm. the ultimate question is, how will we actually reckon, right? And do something else the next mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. I think um, I keep thinking about how a book like The Yellow House three years ago, five years ago, right? You say, I'm from this place and this is what it was like and I want to tell the story of a house and a big family and a hurricane and all the things. And somebody might go, huh. And now you can see the universal appeal of understanding why zoning matters, why the the environmental catastrophe that people are placed inside to warehouse inside of forgotten about inside of you know it changes the fact that there's reception to these ideas that we know to be true but that maybe there's been a lot of gaslighting around so how has the response changed you know not between the award you know and now but between the protests and now Right, as you see collectively white readership change um, its tune to some degree. I think, I think what I sense now is that people are, you know, clamoring for stories of black people and, and they're sort of like, okay, here's a black family story. And I think they're reading it as a kind of uh, lesson in, how black people live and maybe what the issues of their lives are. And I think that's one reading <laughs> that one could take, right? Um, I, I also, I, I have a kind of personal problem with this approach, you know? Mm -hmm. And the reason I have a serious personal problem with this approach, and I think often of the, the fact that James Baldwin said, if I know your name, you ought to know mine, right? And so this idea that there is no way I can be uh, going around saying I'm trying to make writing and not be reading wild, wildly and widely, I, you know, to, to go around being a human in the world and to have survived, to be mm -hmm. this age even. You know, there's a, a level of research and attentiveness I've absolutely had to pay. I've not had the option of not knowing who my neighbor is, right? Mm -hmm. And so my thing is, I, however people come to the work is not my business, right? I made the thing, it's no longer mine in some way. But mm -hmm. I think what I hope for too is, is an ability to simply be with various works by, by black writers and just live with them also as pieces of art, as made and created and composed things, right? Mm -hmm. That aren't necessarily lessons, but that are, are worlds existing onto themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's my hope, you know? But yeah. I don't think I have control over, you know, how people read it and why yeah. they read it. That's completely fair. So I want to talk about, and I'm cheating because of an interview I was reading, and I'm asking about the architecture of the Yellow House, right? How do you, so we even spoke the other day and I sort of said, well, you have an interesting enough family and an interesting enough story, but it could have been just a dud memoir. Like I grew up here, I felt these things, that's it. But it's so much more than that, it's layered. 
and it's researched and it's, you know, multi-genre in some way, thinking about the politics and thinking about the personal. But how did you figure out how to tell the story? So I think uh, over time, I started to think about, you know, if I had as my central question, how do you resurrect a house with words? Mm -hmm. I was thinking really very much about the architecture of any given house and the way in which a book always has an architecture too. And I, I was thinking about, you know, what do I mean for this book to do? How do I want the reader to enter in? Where do I want them to pause? Where do we have to kind of like go back in time? What are the thresholds, right? What are the kind of, and I mean that in the spiritual way, you know, mm -hmm. what are the things you have to know to understand the next thing, right? right. Um, and so I came up with movements because I wanted to use the word movements in all of these multivarious ways, right? I wanted to think about um, actual music, right? And, and what happens as movements change and how a movement can stand alone. Uh, you know, you could just take a piece out of it and hear it and fully understand the whole thing. But of course it's best as it kind of builds and, and something different happens, right? When you're in the third movement. And by the time you make it to the fourth movement, your understanding has changed. And I, I wanted to think also about, of course, the movement of displacement, the movement, the historical movement. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of the narrative, the structure itself, the, the idea that I'm not born for a hundred pages, for instance, mm -hmm. came out of a feeling I had that, that sometimes, you know, uh, black people are made as if they just sort of fell out of the sky, you know, just here we come with our story. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a kind of absence of context, which is also a, a form of displacement for me. That, that, no, I actually didn't fall from the sky. And I have this obsession about place and about home because I am the inheritor right of of all of these ideas and and i was trying to get at this the actual scientific proof that we that trauma is also passed on to us intergenerationally that it doesn't just go away right mm -hmm. and so um it was actually fun to appear a hundred pages in in yeah. the memoir that and, seems like a fun thing to write <laughs> really fun which i love and a very Capricorn um, thing to write. And a very Capricorn thing, yes. So speaking of kind of all the people that came before, you know, I used to roll my eyes. I feel like everybody would be like, the ancestors, and you'd be like, oh, I know. <laughs> but that was like teenage cynical me that didn't know better. And now you do think about the relatively short span of time through which African-Americans have gone through everything. Sure. And what do you think it means to sort of tell those stories in full relief and more to scale for what the future will look like, for even just us, not for America, not for race relations, for us? To tell the stories more in a more yeah to tell to, to to be able to not feel like a history book like to read artful yeah. and there of course are some but I think it's sure. about the volume that we see in the world now and like what does that mean for our literary future our emotional future well that just feels so critical to me because it's sort of how do we make these lasting things that have as their heartbeat, this component of joy, this component of realness, this, this sort of way that we who are telling the story, right, and really understand it, know that these people are not their disaster. There's so much more than that. And they also have existed in a world where 15 things were happening outside the door, right? I think some people are for the first time experiencing that with COVID. They're experiencing a, 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 a global pandemic happening outside their door 
while they also are living and dealing with all the things that happen in your individual and personal life. And I think mm -hmm. for my parents and my grandmother, that was their entire life. You know, their entire life was, there is a catastrophe happening in the world and they were still trying to live. And so I think the what's really exciting about this work mm -hmm. is to try to find the ways to say, okay, we need to be able to look at this from high up but also I want the grit, you know, um, and, and the granular detail that makes mm -hmm. these people come alive. And you know, what's so exciting, Lisa, is that there are a lot of young people in my family who just didn't even know within their own family, the story right. of their own family. And I, I think it feels like a special kind of gift for them to be able to have a, a real beginning, because this does, I think this book is a very preliminary beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but to have it all together and composed, and maybe for them to fight with and disagree with, and maybe write their own version. That's mm -hmm. how I imagine, you know, it. And I think when we write about the Black family, I mean, I know just thinking about my own family, you know, if I were to write about them, it's like I was raised with the strictest this is family business. We don't let them see. So what you end up seeing are these projections of perfection when people talk about their families. We were upstanding black family. We worked hard. You know, we made it through whatever we were going through, but we weren't a mess. We weren't making our own mistakes alongside the sort of societal injustice, you know, creating a false obstacle. Um, and so what does it mean, what does it take, I think, for writers to be able to tell our business and do we need to? And are you still a member in good standing of your family? <laughs> Look, they couldn't disown me no matter how hard they tried. <laughs> it's, it's really- The baby is, doesn't get canceled. Hey, that's, the, that's the good news about being the youngest of 12 children. Um, you know, that's a really good question. And I think both of those things can exist mm -hmm. at the same time. So they have not disowned me. I think part of it is that um, I have always been intrigued by people in general and very, very interested in humans, mm -hmm. right? And in the sort of detail of what makes them the sort of person that they are. And I think that's helped me because it's helped my family understand me, right? And it just has made me an easier person to be around. But but there is a lot of courage required, right? And it's interesting because I think of this a lot. There are very few people who speak directly to their family members. And I mean directly like, you know, what is this belief you have? And why, why do you have it? And, and like the time required to really dig deep and go back mm -hmm. and understand the origin of something. So to get to your question, I, I don't know that everybody needs to go and do an interrogative journalistic, you know, five year report on their family. But I do think the act of asking questions mm -hmm. and, and even being okay with them not being answered just the work of asking mm -hmm. is revelatory about the self in so many ways. And there are ways in which my family were really serving as the history. They, they told me the history of myself mm -hmm. in a way. And, and so I, I think now it feels that I can't even untangle everything I ask them and know about them from, you know, my own history and my own self. So, mm -hmm. but I think that looking at, that direct looking at, that ability to face is is crucial, especially for now. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the current literary landscape, which is opening, right? Like we mm -hmm. see it opening. Do you think that carves out more room for people to be courageous? You know, do you think that people will, you know, with desire for more complicated Black stories, that more people will be confident and courageous enough to write them? Well, I think fiction too. You well, know, it's, it's not just telling your yeah. family story. Like, I keep thinking about Tony sure. K. Bambara's uh, opening sure. uh, story, the prologue for Gorilla My Love, where she's okay. just like the futility. So great. Of, it's so great. great. Writing about your family. 
I hope that that's the direction we're going in. I mean, I think we're watching and seeing, right? We're watching and seeing and, and the whatever courage I have is precisely because of Tony Kate Bambara and because of June Jordan, June Jordan in particular um, for me. And, you know, my story about June Jordan, just because I love to talk about her, was that I was madly in love with her and her work. I think both. And I wanted to go to UC Berkeley just to take her poetry class called Poetry for the People. Mm -hmm. And it was just like this exceptional class with poets coming in every week. And she died of breast cancer the semester before I was going there. And, and I took her class anyway, and it completely changed my life. So all of these, uh, Toni Morrison, and for me, Gail Jones, uh, who is mm -hmm. someone I really study, uh, and, uh, you know, all Jamaica Kincaid for me also, all of these women have, mm -hmm. they created a kind of portal, a freedom, you know, where we could all be. And so I right. hope it is building to that. I mm -hmm. think we still have some work to do. Sure. Uh, because there are the people whose names we don't know who are writing, mm -hmm. but but they're not getting published. So I think we have to figure out who those people are. Right, right, right. And so just to move on a little bit to another topic, I want to talk about your reading life. You did the beautiful by the book, which I dug so much. Um, <laughs> I love those, man. It's just like, if oh I can't see everybody's nice hand, at least I can have so those. So much fun. But you're such a broad reader. I'm curious who you feel like built you as a writer. And I, I feel like there's the technical side and then there's the social, emotional journalist side. I'm curious about both parts. So who built me, like, from a book or in real well, life? Well, who built you because you built yourself using them as a guide? Yeah. So which real person helped me? Yeah, which that? authors? Like, which books? Like, it's like, I wouldn't, oh, I wouldn't be yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I think for me, uh, probably Elizabeth Hardwick, mm -hmm. you know, and Morrison, of course, and Baldwin, and... Like my whole, in recent years, I think the person who expanded me in some very deep, untouchable way was Zabald, I think, mm -hmm. because I became very free in the work as a reader because I wanted to go on these journeys, these things that looked like tangents, but were in fact essential to the telling of the story. And mm -hmm. I really learned something about actual storytelling. And um, and I, I feel that so much of how I think as a person is has to do with Gail Jones's Corregidora and Eva's Man. And just like that language, I can't get it out of my head. You know, it's like, it's like the thing that Toni Morrison's jazz does, which for me is all actually all these types of music in mm -hmm. one and each sort of portion of it becomes a different tune really. Mm -hmm. And just like how just that book for me is so undeniable and gritty and surprising. It's so mm -hmm. utterly surprising, you know? Yeah. So those are, those are my, my people, but, and it changes. Cause like there was a time when I was reading Flannery O'Connor, like crazy mm. and just sort of like living in those worlds she was creating. And, you know, I think it just keeps morphing and I go back to people. And when I was writing the yellow house, I was reading Nicole Krause, her mm. fiction, great house and big love. I think it's called big love. Um, but anyway, I I I, you know, I was like reading David Grossman from Israel and there was like this kind of uh, sensibility I was following, mm -hmm. right? That wasn't so logical, but more based on feeling. Right. So as you explore like craft and, you know, thinking about how to develop your ideas, do you take from other art forms? Like are there painting, you talked about Bearden, who's one of my yeah. favorites. I have a plant named Romare. Oh, I love um, that. He's very colorful. What kind of plant is it? Do you I do not know the names of plants. Okay. It's like a pink and green 
plant oh that's been with me for like 10 years and that's his hilarious. name is Rogan. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, do you, what, do, what, what pieces of art do you think of? What films do you think of? What music? Oh, well, um, Betty Davis and Alice Coltrane are like my two, you know, if, if books can be biblical text, then they are my musical biblical text, you know? And um, Sun Ra, you know, there's like this kind of like mind expanding thing that I love. And, but, yeah, but I want to- played with Sun Ra. Oh God. Seriously. I, I just, though the three of them in some kind of configuration Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, it's interesting because I think so much about painters and I'm drawn to them. I have a, 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 a really large friend group of painters and they're all mm -hmm. actually quite old, but they were the ones who helped me write this book because I would like go to their painting studios and they would talk to me about like how you load a, a brush, how do you load a paintbrush? How, you know, this sort of technique, the way in which painting has all of these layers and these things that, that are behind the thing. And um, I, I think I got so much out of thinking, trying to think visually. And for a time I was trying to learn how to draw. My friend, Mary Frank, was teaching me how to draw with, you know, black Japanese ink and just the motion of it, the tactileness of it was um, healthy for me, I think, because it got me out of my, you know, mind and thinking about words and the sort of strictures of that sometimes. Mm -hmm. But visual artists, you know, there's this artist Whitfield Lavelle mm -hmm. who I, admire just beyond words. And he makes these paintings, which are, you know, families on, on a wall. And then he'll put like a bed in front of it, or he'll put these found objects in front of it. And he mm -hmm. really spoke, he really gave me a kind of insight into my own work. It, mm -hmm. It's like, it existed so that I could see it. And, and try to figure something out that was a word equivalent. But, you know, he's someone, Whitfield Lavelle, who I, I, I keep chasing his work, just wanting mm -hmm. to know it better, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this book feels like it's full of so many things. So much of you, your travels, your different lives, your family, your history, the geography, the politics, disaster displacement, you know, survival. But um, why did it take you 10 years? And I, and I asked that in the spirit of being like, it felt like it needed 10 years. So not like, why did it take you 10 years? <laughs> Which would be okay too. <laughs> well, it took me 10 years for some practical reasons, which was that I had no idea what I was doing and very quickly the money ran out. And so I was starting and stopping. I was just, you know, I'd get into a groove and then I'd stop and make money so that I could get back into the groove. So there was like a lot of fits and starts between it. And so that has taught me something invaluable about the support that writers actually need, right? Mm -hmm. But then beyond that, um, I didn't quite realize what I had bitten off, you know, and because there was so much layering, you know, I would have to make a story, make the, let's say the story of my mother from 1941 to 2010 right. and, and just make that arc and make, build her out as a character, you know, with all the truth, obviously, because I'm writing nonfiction. So I'm trying to make this woman be alive on the page. And that just took forever. And then there's all the siblings and there's, you know, the story of America and within it, the story of New Orleans. And mm -hmm. so just the, the technical, it, it was a very technical thing. 
and I feel like I had to make many books to make it, you know, and, and draw. kids call it doing the most. <laughs> doing the most. I was totally doing the most. You did the most. I was doing the most. I think, I think, you know, the other thing, I was in a lot of denial mm. and I was afraid a lot. And, and so because of those things, I would get off on a completely different tangent. You know, one of them was that I was supposed to be figuring out who my father was. But then I became obsessed with my mother's father, who's this very interesting guy. He like founded New Orleans and he's buried in St. Mm. Louis Cemetery number one. And I thought, oh, this guy is thousands of times more interesting, interesting than my father. And mm. I realized by the end of it that I had spent six months, you know, I could write a whole entire book mm. on my mother's father. Uh, so I was doing that, I think, as a form of a way of not dealing, right. you know, and, and so there were like 10 of those tangents. So if you add that up, right. you know, and, and I think the writing was just hard. I'm just a very, you know, I'm a crazy reviser. I'm, I'm, I'm a rigorous sentence level reviser. You can't tell at all. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love Your sentences sentence. are I love so boy. perfect. But that, you know, um, I wonder so, about that, Lisa, with you having been like in the sort of Guernica world, because mm -hmm. that way of editing was something I actually learned from the magazine. World. I never was an editor. I was always the publisher. So I, the um, yeah. I was not touching the, the, the work. You know, I mean, I admire these diamond shine polished sentences because the Lord knows I do not have the patience. Mm -hmm. to write a sentence 1500 times. I'm usually like, you know, <laughs> trying to raise some money. Like I got to go do 8,000 other things and everything is falling apart. Printer's broken and ADP is calling. Right. So it's like, you know, I haven't polished a sentence since 1995. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the headlock. That'll be the title of your memoir. <laughs> right. Yeah, I haven't polished it. We'll see if it still works. <laughs> but um, so who do you emerge as? Right, you spend 10 years doing this, you come out with a final product, it's beautiful, which you might not have believed then, and hopefully you do now, but maybe you did, because you're a confident woman. Um, but who are you now as an artist? And who were you then? Well, I think it just made me into a writer by finishing, because you know the, the reality of my life is that I, was a person in many different worlds with many different big jobs and and writing was the thing I did you know before my big job and I think it made me a writer and then beyond that there mm -hmm. it, it's just that you just need to finish who am I now I'm a person who has made the first thing and I have I don't I don't need to have confidence in the work itself that's not my job because mm -hmm. my job is to you know, because, you know, I know all the things I wanted to do, but didn't right. do. I'm very clear on that. So my my job, which is also a Capricorn thing to say. Yeah, right? I was like, I was like, Lisa and I, I were born a day apart. So we yes, understand each other in a way. But um, I think now what what feels different for sure is that right. I know that I can make a book. Right. That And, and mm -hmm. you don't know that until you make it, right? Mm-hmm. So now I have this sort of the the pump. If I have any pomposity whatsoever, mm -hmm. it's that I I feel that I can devote myself and commit to something, which is a marathon, which mm -hmm. is 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 a time consuming alternate world that you have to go live in for a right. while, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of questions actually, and if everybody has other questions, we're going to start asking those. So you actually started to talk about this and I want to follow up, but was there material you wrote, um, that didn't make it into the book? So you just talked about sort of all these yeah. tangents that you went on. What happens to that material? Is it a new book? Is it like, do you just throw it all out? Like burn no, it like no, no. Kafka? No. You know what? There's so much material. So first of all, I did hundreds of hours of interviews with my family and I mm -hmm. only transcribed one fourth of them because it, it was taking too long. And I was worried that I was going to spend eight years transcribing and mm -hmm. never write. So at some point I just stopped transcribing. If there was a conversation, 
I had notes about and I needed to find, I'd go find it. But there's all these untranscribed interviews for one. And all these tangents I was on, you know, it's like in some box now, you know, I put all that stuff in a box and, you know, one day maybe it'll become something else, but no time soon. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Another one is how would you feel if the yellow house was turned into a film? Do you feel some of the essence developed through the written work would be lost or intensified if turned into a film? You know, I, I truly understand the difference between a book and a film. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think I would approach it with a sense of detachment. Mm -hmm. Or I would, mm -hmm. I've so far said I didn't want a film made, which demonstrates that I have no detachment. But I think, I think that I would, I would hope to evolve to the spot where I just don't have any feelings about it because it's not a book, it's a film. You know, and right. it, it has to do different things. How do you let go of a baby? Well, believe me, I've let go. I, I, I want to let go more, but you know, there's that little, you know, it's weird. You know, it's like when you have the book, it's truly a little baby. And it's like you mm. send it out and it becomes other people's baby, but then it sort of comes back home. So now it's in the process of becoming mm -hmm. something else for me. Do you think whenever it is that you do a second book, do you think it'll release you from the Yellow House? I mean, it'll never fully. Not fully, but like, you know, sort of just like that ability to sort of be distanced from it. This could be yeah. a film, this is gonna have its life. Yeah, I, I honestly, it could be a film now. I, I, I just don't, I want to just emphasize that I really understand the difference and that a film can only do so much. Right. You know, and books can do everything. Maybe a limited <laughs> series would be better. <laughs> in case anybody is interested in limited series, <laughs> no. you know, Sarah thinks that maybe something one, two seasons, 12, 14 episodes yeah. might yeah. be good. A handful of episodes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how about what's your favorite passage from the book? Oh, I don't have a. And is there one that you might change? That I oh, feel like there would be so dragons. Many, so many, so many, <laughs> so many. Everything. <laughs> I wouldn't change any of them, but the author's always. I like, mean, you can't go back and read your book, right? Ever, really? Ever, ever, ever. Oh my God. <laughs> do you read the same passages when you do read? Yeah, just because I don't want to see anything new. It's actually a, a thing I should do differently, but. Generally, I've only read one of two passages, basically because I don't want to see, <laughs> I just don't want to face. <laughs> what but there's nothing you could do. It's there. It won it's the National there. Book Award. It's like, there. you're good. No, it's there. But I, I can see. I can't watch. Like, if I'm, like, doing some nerdy interview, sure. I can't watch it again because it's just, like, you know. It's hard, yeah. And that just seems like it would be worse because it's your full brain exposed. Yeah. But we like it. And okay, everybody so. should buy it. Everybody's already bought it, right? You're in the, in the process <laughs> of buying it from uh, independent. <laughs> um, all right, somebody's asking what you were working on. Would you foray into fiction? And I'm gonna say, we're not asking that. That's right. Because we wanna be nice to people who are still enjoying their paperback moment of no pressure. Um, but thank you for your but question. Working is great. It's nice to be working. Mm -hmm. Working is happening. Yes. Definitely. Awesome. Um, any more questions, you all? We've got a couple more. I have some, of course. And look, okay. people in the comments are saying, uh, bought it for my sister. Nice. Denise, just purchased. Come Thank on, you, keep it coming. Denise. Thank Love you. Love to see you. Christine. Uh, moving there. units, moving yeah. units. Um, so what, um, you were talking about having with a literary dinner with Natasha Trethaway, Kiasi Lehman, and it was somebody else in the interview, right? And uh, Imani Perry. And Imani Perry. We're all, right? we're all Southern cousins, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then we're going to have Lorraine Hansberry, Audrey Lord from The Dead, and also, mm -hmm. um, who was my other one? June Jordan. Okay, yeah, no, that's perfect. So just to Southern literature, Right, you are from Louisiana. Amani's from Alabama. 
Keith's yeah. from Mississippi. Mississippi, yeah. And Natasha's from Mississippi. What binds you as writers, as Southern folks? Uh, it's, you know, it's our, it's sort of our constitution, I would say. It's not just the mm -hmm. fact that we're working writers, but there's something, you know, kindness is underrated these days. There are too few kind people, I think, in the world. And so part of it for me is that I find them to be utterly kind human beings, first and foremost. And, you know, they know how to party. They know how to drink bourbon, right? We could talk about our work. We can talk about structure. We can, you know, talk about all these craft things. Mm -hmm. um, there's this real feeling of kinship. I mean, I only met Natasha Trethewey one time, but I've mm -hmm. lived with her work for so many years. And also the same for Kiesi and Imani Perry going all the way back, you mm -hmm. know? And so, I don't know, I have this sort of great love for them and and also enormous respect for what they're yeah, doing they're as, as artists. Yeah. yeah. I would like to be invited to that party. <laughs> just to, I'll be quiet, I'll bring the drinks, whatever. I just want to listen. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the party. Uh, um, so, you know, back to sort of Southern literature, I think when you look at the trajectory of Key, when you look at my, well, a lot of it, why do you think it's taken so long for people to publish Black Southern literature well? Hmm. I mean, obviously there are always examples, mm -hmm. but you know, when you look at Kiesi trying to get published. You know, when you look at Jasmine getting published, when you just look at the road versus like a young upstart selling a 900 page book about New York City and gets paid a million dollars off the cuff at 26. Why do you think that it's been a different journey? Well, I think the answer to that question has something to do about how the, where the South exists in the American psyche, which is to say that people are often trying their best to say, oh, we're not like them. And, and <laughs> to sort of act as if the South isn't in fact the nature of the country laid bare, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that's part of it is that there's this sort of stepchild feeling and and some of our greatest writers of all time are southern people i mean if you step foot in mississippi you need to understand right the incredible writers who who came out of mississippi and their their contribution to american literature so i think it's just i, I think it's that i think it's how people think about the south how it sort of exists in the american psyche and mm -hmm. and you know just I, you know, also maybe it has something to do with editors, you know, because mm. I think writers need great editors and you need an editor who believes in your work, who takes it on, who says, mm. I see what you're trying to do. Keep it's going. also about language. I mean, it's like the black vernacular, you know what I mean? It's just like, that's hard to edit. And you look at how Baldwin uses commas, right? That has to do with the rhythm of speech, one would imagine. So I, I Yeah, but I mean, we have a lot of Southern writers who, you know, I, I think that's also a cop out, actually. Yeah, fair language. enough. I mean, writers do language, as Morrison reminded us. So, mm -hmm. so that's what that's what we're here for. <laughs> I was actually referencing a story about Toni Morrison. So she used to get in. A, I did a panel. Yeah. Uh, and her um, editor used to argue with her about commas all the time. Bob Gottlieb, and then he heard her read one day, and he said, "Oh." That's what it sounds like. Wow. Which is what made me think about the fact yeah, that we also need people who understand our voices yeah. because even she struggled with that. Yeah, I mean, come on, language. If you can't do language, what are you doing? You're right, I'm fair enough. <laughs> All right, I think we've got one more question okay. from the audience. And so somebody said, I was listening to an interview uh, with the author of The Undocumented Americans. And she was saying how there was material she looked at now in light of the pandemic and the protests. and wish she had done more with it or done something differently. Um, is there anything that you look back now at and feel like you really wish 
you had done differently because of the times? Or do you think that writing exists independent of the times? Yeah, no, because I actually think I, I think within this book, I have written about this particular time. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that. Yeah, yeah. no, I would. So I, I, think, I think the only thing I know that I could do is more, but mm -hmm. I ran, you know, it's one book. It you have to finish it at some point. Yeah, you have to turn the thing in. But I, I right. know for a fact that it feels very preliminary to me. Hmm. That's the story. Right. Well, I adore this book. Thank I mean, it is book. just one of the great pieces of literature that we've gotten. Thank you. And it's a gift. And all of you watching right now, I hope that you purchase the book. And then I hope that you actually read it <laughs> and soon because it's enriching and it's important. And I think that um, for all of Sarah's artistry, um, and the layers and the way that she's coming at it. I think that um, we take a lot in this moment as readers from her deft and, you know, lyrical and uh, exhaustive exploration of her own family and the context in which they live. So thank you, thank Sarah. You. Thank you, Lisa. Paperbacks. Thank you. you had. <laughs> and thank you all for dealing with our momentary um, Apps. little uh, situation. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Thank you. I'm Thanks, gonna, Lisa. I'm going to try my microphone just to come in and say thank you, Lisa, so much for a uh, lovely conversation. Sarah, thank you for being here tonight and for this thank one. You. Thank you to everyone Thanks, for all the patience. Um, it was absolutely wonderful. Have a great night, everyone. Good thank night. You. Bye.